Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight we have the privilege of listening to an important conversation with Musi Maimani, facilitated by Anton Katz. Both gentlemen are well known in our community, so I will be brief with my introductions. Musi is a social activist at heart. From a very young age, he fought for the dignity of the poor and marginalized in our society. This passion ignited his vision for his social movement, One South Africa, creating a united, reconciled and prosperous country. Musi has an impressive bio. He speaks eight languages, has two master's degrees, is working towards his PhD and is an experienced businessman. Anton is a silk an honor conferred by the president to advocates for exceptional skill, integrity, and leadership. Anton has been practicing as a senior counsel for over 30 years and is a human rights activist. He is a leading constitutional lawyer who has appeared numerous times before the constitutional court in various groundbreaking judgments on various constitutional matters. The context of tonight's discussion is understanding Musi's vision for the future of South Africa through entrepreneurship and education, discussing hope and how through opportunities, success can be created. This is aligned to Orjet's purpose as we are a community organization empowering entrepreneurs. Feel free to post comments and questions in the chat box and Brenna will address them at the end. A reminder to please keep your microphones on mute. Thank you, Musi and Anton, for your time and engaging in this conversation with us. Over to you, Anton. Thank, thank you, Lisa. Um, Musi, I've known you for a number of years on, on different levels, and um, we chuckled briefly before this meeting started and you made certain comments about <laughs> what I would call the boring nature of South African politics. But I want to leave that for a second and turn to what will, from what, to my mind, become the foundation for our discussion. And that is, who is Musi Mamani? There's a book written about you. You've got a Wikipedia page. We know that you were born many, many years before any of us sitting on this Zoom. And here you have this, uh, you have this, introduction of being this very powerful, important person, which you are. Who are you? You were born in 1980. Um, you were a toddler during the, the 80s. What happened? Tell us about your birth. Who were your parents? Tell us a bit about you. And that can start the conversation about where we are today. We being you, I, and all these other people on this platform. And what it means to be a South African in the world as it of today. Sure. Thanks, uh, Firstly, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Anton and Lisa and Bort as an organization. It's my great privilege to be here and, um, uh, and, and count it a, a real blessing to be with everybody um, in such unique times in South Africa. You know, I wouldn't have thought two years ago the only way we could talk to people was through Zoom platform. In fact, I didn't even know what Zoom was. I'm sure, Anton, you wouldn't have heard of Zoom, um, considering the age difference between you and I. But I'll, <laughs> I'll carry on on the basis of saying that Musi is a... I consider myself truly a, a product of this beautiful country. I come from... My mother's a Tosa woman from the Eastern Cape. And my father is a Tswana South African. And that's why the combination of both meant that they gave me an opportunity to have eight ability to speak eight languages. I, I grew up less than seven Ks from Nelson Mandela's home in Soweto. And so that in and of itself meant that even if you yourself were not interested in politics, politics were interested in you. The 80s was a fascinating time. I loved growing up in Soweto. It shaped so much. I loved the football, loved the music, loved the people. And at the same time as that, for me, growing up, violence between the ANC and the IFP, all state-sponsored, 
were not an anomaly. Uh, it was not abnormal for me to be on my way to school and walk past someone being necklaced as an example. And that as a young black child, you learn quickly how to make a petrol bomb before you can ride a bike. So these are the dichotomy of the experiences that you grow up with as a child. And post that, got married to a half Welsh, half Lebanese woman. And so you can now fully understand that my kids are a true potpourri of, of South Africa. And I, I think it's been a testimony to almost in some ways that I, the, the, the contrasts of this country. Yeah, at one level, you get her and I were raised on opposite sides of the fence, thanks to apartheid. Yet we found love and naturally subsequent to that, we're now trying to forge ahead to demonstrate to South Africans that racism in and of itself is a sin, but races are not opposed to one another and that truly we could build a South Africa for all. And if we can demonstrate it, at least as a nuclear family, it's possible for us as a country. So, so that's in some ways my, pers- my politics are both personal and and secondly, communal in that they Soweto, and more South Africa in that I think that the last place I'd want to live in is a country where my kids one day would have to face and confront the very evils we grew up confronting. I wish they'd find new ones, find new challenges that for them, they must struggle for a new freedom, not for the freedoms I should have been fighting for. So. So that's, that's me. I hope that kind of gives you a, a bit of a tapestry of where I come from. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Musi. Um, that's useful. In moving to the next topic, which is, in a sense, to be apolitical, whatever that might mean, in a country such as South Africa, is actually to be political. So during apartheid, I remember some of my parents' friends would say, we apolitical. But that would be a cop-out because... By definition, every day we live a political life. So yeah. the notion of politics and how we live are inextricably interlinked. Although ORT and ORT JET are organizations which is true, issue, let's call it party politics. In other words, whether this party is good or that party is bad, that's not something that the hosts of this webinar are concerned with. What they are concerned with is entrepreneurship and education. And that's where you come in. You've had a long career with different facets to it. And well, let's call it, I wouldn't say long because you've had a stellar career in a shorter space of time than than many of us um, could have hoped for, but you've risen to these heights. Perhaps you can just give us a taste of the different aspects of your career to lead you to where you are today. Yeah, and and I think it's in some ways the, I'm, I'm most grateful that in my life I've been able to build an arsenal of different things. You know, I, I started off in, in a church community, so I come from a very deep faith background. We then ran a number of NGOs that are focused on the very subject you are discussing. In fact, I would never re-enter politics. In other words, when, when, I, when we finished school, the only thing that we had was the NC, and so we're part of the branch in Soweto, all of that. And then we left that side of politics to pursue the sense of justice, the ability to be able to go, can I I do something for our community? And and I remember almost starkly, I walked into a house one day where a a lady, a a gogo was was busy digging a hole in the garden. I said to her, mom, what are you doing? She said, you know, look, I'm, 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 I'm building a toilet. I said, how can it be that in a democratic South Africa, we actually don't have, um, a toilet for this woman. I just left my house that has five toilets. How do I get in this situation? So there was a profound injustice. It felt like what my Rosa Parks moment felt like that day. And that in many ways inspired me to roll up my sleeves and said, I'm gonna get involved in politics, not in party politics, in the sense that I really genuinely believe that an injustice was being committed. And that's what layers South Africa today, is that I think for many of us, I think party politics is but one component of society. But in truth, let's be honest and say, 11 million South Africans are not finding work. The majority of them are young people. I know a few people who have died of COVID, but I know many more businesses that have. 
and it's not keeping score because life and business don't always equate and shouldn't equate. But I think we should never deny the fact that we're living in times now that if you project this movie going forward, it's not, we have a country to which all of us must be invested in. And that's why I think what what Jet are doing is so profound in this entrepreneurship space, but it's so vital if we're going to get it right in South Africa, because it's irrelevant which political party you talk about. At least all of us must wake up with a sense that says, it can't be that I leave my home with a few toilets and others don't. It can't be that I get to throw away food and others don't, uh, and, and others don't have food. It can't be that when you look at the class structure in South Africa, you know, over 55% of the people in this country live on less than 1,180. So, so it's a, it's, 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 it, and only less than 5% earn over 20,000. So it tells a story about this profound inequality that we have So when I, to finish the story, when I left the woman with the toilet, I, at the time I was consulting for and work for companies, speaking to South Africans, I thought to myself, here I am doing this in the private sector at the public sector suffering. Here, I'm, here I am making someone sell more chocolates and there's nothing wrong with a viable business like Nestle being in South Africa, but how many kids don't actually have textbooks? It really spurred me on to activism. And I think, you know, if you were to sum up my life and perhaps maybe I, I haven't said it often enough in a public space, is that I'm far less of an ideologue so much as someone who's sitting out and going, we have a country to fix, we have a future to contest for, and let's find leadership that is able to chart our way towards that. So my obsession is about what is coming next in South Africa rather than what's happened. And so to your earlier comment, when I said I find our politics boring, is that I, I don't necessarily believe that our politics are designed to solve our problems at this point in time. I think our politics are designed to solve the problems of political parties. It's a different issue compared to the problems of society. And the problems are, here we are, we are without a vaccine, we're without education, we're without entrepreneurs, and more than anything, we have a public service that's heavily corrupted and incapable. Now, that to me is a risk that all of us face. It's a risk that in part, ought is trying to address, but I think all of us must do, do, do something about it. That's why I find what I read in newspapers so profoundly depressing and boring in some ways. And I think we need to answer some really difficult questions because as much as I love my parents, they suffered under apartheid, but I can't be spending my life answering their questions whilst my kids' questions are going ignored. Yeah, just, just on that, Missy, um, if it's not political parties that are, let's call it the problem, maybe it's the political system that generates some of the difficulties that you've articulated. And could you comment on that? Um, what's your sense of the political system that South Africa adopted 25 years ago, yeah. which has given rise to what you call the incompetence and the, well, and the corruption of the public service and the, the different arms of government, executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, where has this problem seeped in? Is it the political system or is it something else? Or is it just human beings? And I'll, and I'll just go back to uh, somebody that I worked for, who was a lawyer for the, for the United Nations. And he was, he was very old when I worked for him, he was well into his eighties. And he said, it's not the system that's the problem, it's the people that are the problem. So it doesn't help to reform a system if the people are bad anyway, or to have a good system with bad people is not a good idea, but to have an okay system with good people is the problem. Can you comment on South Africa's political system? How do you see changes to deal with this question of who the people are who should be dealing with us? Or is it some, is there just, we, we are just bad? And I don't mean bad in the sense of evil. I mean bad, <laughs> um, difficult. I mean, I mean, without trying to, whitewash and maybe be history focused. The fact of the matter is that South Africa has gone through histories of oppression of one race over another, whether it's colonial history or apartheid history or our recent history, right? Uh, and because of that, we almost always 
waiting for the next cycle to occur, which is a dominance of another race over another, which pollutes the political party system. And I'll get back to the other and the people in that. Because if that is your struggle, if that is, I think uh, it was Raymond Zondo or someone who argued it so well to say, if ours is just to simply wait for the next liberation movement, all we end up doing is we have to answer, what is someone liberating someone from? And naturally you have these cycles that are occurring. And I think that has meant that sometimes political parties are either you are for one race against another. And I don't know if that's, that's firstly, that creates a problem and it captures the institutions of the country to work a particular way. The second thing is, I think we've robbed ourselves of leadership. You know, if you went to the US, where institutions are strong, leaders matter less because it doesn't matter who gets elected, the institutions will stand strong. In Africa, our institutions are weak, so leaders matter a whole lot more. That's why even in an imperfect system, you can have someone like Nelson Mandela pursuing a unified country and working towards saying, how do we achieve a way forward? But if you then take out someone like Nelson Mandela and the institutions are, are not there, even a terrible leader is able to succeed with their project, regardless of how good or bad their project is. So what we've got to fix is to say, how do we work on institutional democracy that is able to safeguard this? You're a respected silk, I respect you personally, but no one can deny the fact that we're now sitting today, I've got a, a matter even in the Western Cape High Court, where I'm thinking, I hope judge so-and-so is not there, but this judge is there. Now, that's unhealthy for democracy. It means the institution of the judiciary is already something that we've got to rework. So fixing the leadership question of this country isn't just getting another political party or political class. It's about making sure that you've got judges that are working, you've got medias that are working, you've got business men and women who are focused on this country because they're not immune to corruption. You've got civic society that is participating, whether it's faith-based organizations, institutions such as this one, able to say, how do we collectively agree on what is the South African vision? And that's why when, I, when we started One South Africa, we wanted to be clear that we can't be living in the many South Africa. So South Africa that is white or black, the South Africa that is rich or poor. That's not what we want. We want a South Africa that works for everybody. And then thirdly, this issue of the electoral question, because I think if you were a South African living, like I know, you know, more people died in this country between 1990 than 1994 than all of apartheid. Because it was one of the most violent times in our country. And part of that was not only the violence in KZN, but it also became the birth pains of incredible leaders who emerged during that time. People were able to stand up in their communities and say, whilst we might all be bloodthirsty, let's stand up for South Africa. And for me, one of the single most powerful leadership moment I reference, I always look at, is Nelson Mandela addressing South Africans after the killing of Chris Hani. I thought there was a moment in our country where post that day, I can remember even the tracksuit that Tokyo Sohwale was wearing. I remember the image so seared in my mind, but here was a, a statesman who was not the president speaking as the president of the country to say, we support the Afrikaans woman who reported the case and we celebrate that we can work together, building reconciliation. But that came out of activism. So to me, I think what we've got to get back to is even in 94, the reason we went the electoral system that we've got at the moment was because we all thought that, well, the agreement then was we didn't want the NC to win everywhere and the minority is not to be represented, but it wasn't gonna be a position we keep forever. But now what needs to happen is that we need to go back to that point where we say, can we reform back to constituencies? Can we get people who are accountable to us so that even if a person is good or bad, the accountability always lies with the people. You see, for me, I don't really care who voters elect. I do care to a certain degree, but I do care that I care more that those voters are able to say, we made a mistake, we can remove this person, or we think this person is great, we should vote for them again. So long as voters always have that power, then the system is working. That's why we fought so hard for electoral reform, a constituency-based system, a place where people can know who they're voting for as individuals so that they can use their power to remove that person. And ultimately, 
accountability is affected by the citizens and that you, in a society that is corrupt, I always jokingly say to people, our current model says, if you buy one, you can get an entire party for free. If we reform our system, we can buy one and get that one for free if they are prone to be corrupt and we can remove them. So I think we have to reform our electoral system. We can't carry on like this because as things stand at the moment, loyalty amongst politician, politicians is firstly to the party and never to the citizens. And I can say categorically, having been in the system. Um, I want to come back to that point because it's crucial. But before I do, I just want to touch something, touch on something that you may have um, triggered in my mind. And that is this. We've had all these years of colonialism, apartheid, and we, South Africans, have experienced trauma, all of us, in different ways. And for, for Black people to deny that white people have is problematic on some level. And for white people to, to wish away or think away 300 years of being regarded as lesser is unacceptable. There has been this trauma. And what I want to touch upon is this. As a group, we've experienced this trauma. Do we not need therapy as a group in the same way that an individual who, who has been traumatized needs healing and needs some kind of assistance in moving away from this, let's call it baggage-driven existence? Aren't we as a society, with all the trauma that we've experienced, aren't we in similar need of some type of healing? And how would you think that we could obtain that type of healing? I think the best analogy I can give is to say, in 1994, we had an arranged marriage between black people and white people. And like an arranged marriage, we were, maybe we may have been enthusiastic about how things would work. We, like a, a good or a bad marriage, we were trying to figure out who manages the money, who does this, who does that. And now that that marriage has gone on for a number of years, we're starting to wonder whether it's sustainable. And so to your earlier point, I do think we need counseling to face the difficult conversations. It's, we've got to be able to say to ourselves, well, what does one mean? Can we be willing to be honest about conversations? Am I willing to hear an African South African who says, but I have grandparents who grew up in concentration camps and recognize the pain that means. Am I willing to hear a Jewish South African who says the history that we come from in regardless of the color of our skin, both being victimized in one continent and on another place, recognizing the fact that we were on the side of assisting the struggle for freedom. I must be willing to hear that. And I must equally be willing to hear the fact that for many, even black South Africans still feel like, but things haven't changed since 94. And we feel like we've got these parents who have somewhat abandoned us. All of those pains need discussion. But the next part is who's the counselor without trying to overstretch the analogy. And the counselor in this instance is a very central, capable state. Because if you don't have adults, you know, and I'm, I'm a black South African, we, we talk about lobola. And in a lobola culture, you go and the uncles go and sit around and they go negotiate dowry there, but they keep the marriage together. You need those uncles to, to be able to say, well, having heard the stories, what are some of the things that we need to do that make sure we never achieve that? Part, we South Africans know how to deal with legalized racism and racial segregation. That's how we dealt with apartheid. But we don't always know how to deal with social racism. We feel like someone, we don't know how to deal with that. And so we need other people to help us process that. And that requires that we have relationships across different racial lines that force us to be able to hear the other side, however uncomfortable that is. But also we need to think about economic reconciliation. It is, it's not helpful to my kids when I, in, in a mixed marriage, when we walk around and they say to me, but daddy, why is it that when I see people begging, it's primarily brown people? Now, it's an important question. And I can't just separate it by just simply saying, well, well, we're trying to sort something out here, ignore that. Because I need to help them know that actually 
that is part of us building a reconciled society is about addressing that injustice and they are a part of a solution. How do we, you know, my daughter fights with me about the, I take a position on free education and she's like, well, I'm fortunate in that you work and I'll, you'll pay for my education, but it's unfair that the kids who are protesting don't get that opportunity. That's her, she's at 10. So she's fighting with me about this issue. And I can see that that's part of healing our nation going forward. So, and then lastly, I think we need to talk about socially, what are the infrastructural things that, that we've suffered from? Because in truth, you know, we can't be, and I know this will sound quite difficult for many people to hear, but it's tempting to send your kids to a school that's just got kids that look like them, but it doesn't help them. I want my kids to go to a school where in the classroom, they're experiencing someone of a Jewish faith, of a Muslim faith, of a who's black, who's white, who's rich, who's poor. Does it help them? Now, if you live in particular communities and in places, you can quickly discover that you'll never know what the other side looks like because you're never exposed to it. So we've got to not only change the way education works, we've got to change sometimes even how the economy works. I've seen in too many spaces where people arrive. And if you are not in that social circle, if you're not from that community, you're not going to get into that table to negotiate deals. Part of us healing this country requires us to do that. And then lastly, I'll say this. Like any marriage, if it lacks a vision for tomorrow, it is going to die. People perish because of lack of vision. We have to come, uh, as, as, as they say in Afrikaans, come hell of Wovaka. We've got to work out quite quickly what tomorrow looks like for all of us. And all of us must commit ourselves to that. Because if we all of us can sit down and say, right, in the next five years, we've all got to make sure that, especially post COVID, that we can't, if another wave, another virus hits us in five years time, people must be living in shacks. All of us must agree that's wrong. So let's go do something about it. All of us must agree that we can't have a healthcare for wealthy people and a healthcare for poor people. All of us must work towards that. All of us must say, we want an education. And all of these things are in our constitution, by the way. We want an education that is available for everybody. We're gonna all work towards it. We want an economy that is growing at this level that addresses inequality at that level. And we have a fund that helps new startups. That's what we're gonna do. Because the surest way to heal is not, on, is not only to have a dialogue amongst ourselves, but to have goals that we set for the future. Because at the end of the day, my wife and I might disagree on many things, but when it's said and done, both of us are concerned about the future of our kids. And so sometimes even when we think, oh, I don't agree with you, we've got kids to think about. And South Africa must also say the same. Black people and white people might sit down and say, well, we don't agree. But to tell you the truth, both of them have got kids to think about. Amusi, um, I'm very attracted to your notion of a conversation as part of a counseling or the, a therapeutic healing of the nation as a whole. And just the thought that I had was that wherever the Zondo Commission goes, the mere fact that we have been able to watch and hear for example, the president of the ANC, the president of the country, explaining away the malfeasance of the government has been, for me anyway, of some type of assistance and healing. And I, I listened last week and I thought, wow, is that where we've gone so wrong? But it was, it was a healing moment, I think, for the country to have just experienced that talking out and listening and being heard. I want to come back to two, com two issues. Um, which you perhaps have touched upon. One is this, the political system. And you have said that, if I understand you correctly, that the party political system that was that the foundation of the constitution and the new society that the arranged marriage that you spoke of hasn't worked and isn't working. Tell us about your future working solution for the political system. Uh, we know, perhaps I should just introduce that the parliament had passed a law which allowed for persons to stand for the National Assembly only through political parties. If I understand it correctly, you were part of a movement that found went to court and the constitutional court ruled that that was not constitutional and that individuals could who should be entitled to stand for parliament. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is the reformation of the electoral law because where the supreme law of the land and the constitution says, Public, representative, public representation is a right for every individual citizen. 
the electoral law says you can only do that through a party system. So we fought to say that there was a dichotomy in the electoral law and the constitution, and therefore the electoral law had to be reformed. And what that has meant is that now it gives individuals the right to, for public representation at a national level. We've written the laws, we've written a draft electoral reform bill, and that has for us maybe five non-negotiables. The first is that individuals must be allowed to stand, which is, I think is an important thing. Secondly, is that to do that and to give real effect to that, you can't just take the ballot box and say, okay, here are the parties, we'll add as many individuals as possible. You have to reform to a constituency-based system. And we've proposed rather a multi-member constituency system. So about 57 constituencies in the country to which all of us as voters can arrive there and go, okay, I'm voting in Cape Town and in Cape Town, I'm going to elect the following people. And even if they belong to a party, but I know them, which is the third component of the issue, which is an open list system rather than a closed list system. Because a closed list system says, you just vote for the party and the party can tell you who they like, which, you know, like that's the danger in party political system is that you could put a front man who is, um, who is decent and whatever and line them up with the rest of criminals and the citizens will never know. So whereas now what we're saying is make sure that you can literally know who you are voting for. Fourthly, it's the dynamic of digital voting, which makes the elections a little bit quicker and much more effective because ballot boxes and ballot systems are sometimes cumbersome. And then lastly, which is that along with all of those things above, reduce the National Assembly so that you end up with 300 MPs who are in constituencies and 50 on a proportional basis because then that way, you still maintain proportionality. So that's what we're proposing as a way forward because we think if we could take all of those elements on the table, not only will it strengthen democracy, it will achieve what the constitution envisages anyways. Like many people don't always know that on the day the president is elected, the president of the Republic, they cease being a member of parliament because the drafters of the constitution wanted to make sure that the separation of powers and the executive standing elsewhere and the president not being almost a straitjacketed by the party political infrastructure was always maintained. Because if we just carry on like this, then we might as well just watch conference and party conferences and think that's where democracy is. But if to give full effect of it, let's maybe even consider the direct election of the president, because a bit like in other democracies, certainly in Africa, if you are voting in Malawi, you will know I'm voting for President Maimani or President Mbeki or President Zuma or President Ramaphosa. You directly know that. And then you know if they fail, you can directly remove them. So I think there's an opportunity to reform. I, I think we've got to be bold here, Anton. And I think, so we fought that case and we're setting it in place. And what that I think will do is that even if an MP arrives in parliament and says the people of Bantry Bay want this, but my party says we will have expropriation without compensation as an argument, then that person can stand up and say, I either reject that or I accept it. Or if I reject it because the citizens want something else, I have to vote with the citizens always because those are the people who voted for me rather than defending a party position. And I think that will make parliament more relevant and make power back to the people. And Musi, um, I've got two more topics, but before I touch on that, I note you set out all these hypothetical presidents that one might want to vote for yourself, President Mbeki, President Zuma, but you left off me. Um, ah, so there we go. So stand <laughs> in 20. <laughs> what, well, the, two, the two topics that I want to touch on is, is the first is, uh, perhaps I should do the first one, then I'll ask you the, the second one. What is one <laughs> South Africa movement? What is it? It's not a political party. Yeah. And where does it fit in, in the in the world? Is it an NGO? What does it do and how does it do it? And, and what would you want, if anything, to come out of this webinar on the question of assisting one South Africa movement? What is it? Yeah, and it's a great question. One South Africa really is a grassroots movement. It's a social movement. We advocate for education, entrepreneurship, and direct elections. And we call upon everybody to be activists in their communities and make a difference where they're at. Because we think leadership is grassroots. Leadership comes from the people. It's always by the people. So we've built this movement that's got representation across all nine provinces. We let people link into all of that and say, 
can you make a difference in education? Can you make a difference in entrepreneurship? So like we run a center for a blended learning where people can come in and young people can get skills, learn stuff online. Last year, thanks to Dawn, who's on this webinar, uh, we were able to set up um, an, an, an a women's entrepreneurship program, which we're looking at repeating this year, Dawn, thanks to you, so that we can make sure that more and more people are able to pitch ideas. And there was a young girl called Lesejo who was able to come up with a great idea. We put some capital into a business, not a lot of money, really. And now she's pursuing other deals with retailers in this country. Because we genuinely believe if we can give venture capital, we can give social support, we can give financial capital, we can able to achieve a rollout of entrepreneurs. And next year, and this year, we'll probably do the same. And so that's what One South Africa is about. And it's in the name is the purpose. It's saying that let's break down the walls. Let's Let's forget this idea that, um, and, and for me, I celebrate diversity. I don't apologize for being black and I don't, I don't wanna be defined anything other than being black, but I accept the fact that I'm equally a South African. And so we, we proudly say, if we break down the walls, can black people, white people, Indian people, colored people, Christians, Jews work together to be able to achieve activism in their communities in those three areas so we can bring change. So, to your question, what would I like to see come out of this webinar? We always need skills, people with skills. It's one of the deficits in this country. You know, uh, one of my friends is a great economist, uh, uh, a Venezuelan says always that your job is to make sure skilled people are able to connect with non-skilled people because then we can transfer knowledge. Sitting in this webinar, people with talent, get your skills in there. What about going to volunteer at your governing body in a school that is not yours? Say you'll help because my kid's school has got great governing body members, they're advocates, lawyers, and all of that, because it's a high LSM school. It's a public school, but it's a high LSM. But what about uh, you volunteering to say, I'm Anton, I'm going to go work in a poor community and help coach some governing body members so that the school can run better. It's that sort of activism we want to see. We organize people in communities. So I'd like for you to contribute your skills, contribute your activism in communities, and work like anything to be able to identify candidates that can represent you both at local government, provincial government and national government and be able to vote for them so that they are ultimately accountable to you. If we can all build an Uber of politics by Uber, I mean, we don't have to own the drivers, own the people. All you have to do is make sure that their standards are in place and we can be able to send them to parliament. I think that'd be powerful. So your support, your activism, I don't believe in just the question of membership. I think that people must be active in their communities because when we do that, South Africa truly can belong to all of us and we can build that one South Africa. So that's just, what I'm trying to do. You know, I, there's a question in the chat room and I, I welcome people on the, on the Zoom to, to send questions if they are interested in, um, to ask questions, which I can pose to you, Lucy. But the one question is, what, what about, what's your vision on entrepreneurship? And I think you've answered it to a certain extent. And let me just add, perhaps a way that you, you mentioned that, you know, skilled people can share that which they have with non-skilled. For example, people on this webinar might, as you mentioned, Bantry Bay or Atlantic Seaboard, maybe they can offer the skill that they have to the people who come to work in their houses, the domestic workers, the nannies, and that would be a, a, just a suggestion off the top of my head, and I hadn't thought it. Um, for instance, the kids of the domestic workers can learn from the, let's call it, those who live in these um, affluent, previously white only areas. I want to ask you this. The One South Africa movement is not going to, it's a civic organization and it doesn't intend to involve itself in politics in, in the regular manner. Is that right? Yeah. What, uh, what, we des what we desperately want is for people to own democracy themselves. We, as I say to people, when it comes to the politics of the issue, we're just Uber. You know, Uber doesn't own the car, doesn't own the driver, but it gives you the standards. So what we're saying is, here's what a good candidate looks like against four or five criteria. They are non-racial, they are ethical, they are future focused, they believe in a strong education, they build entrepreneurs. That's what it looks like. Those are the standards. You identify a person that matches that, we will help you work with your community to make sure that person can be elected both in a council or at a national level. And, and then you as the community, they're in charge to you, they're accountable to you. 
you are the body that works with that person. That's what we want to do. Now, in achieving that, what kinds of international partners do you have? I mean, I know of a, a New York, um, let's call it NGO, which assists impoverished school children in Hout Bay through an art project hmm. and it works. The children's education is enhanced immeasurably by this art project where they turn up at particular venues to do art. And do you have any links to, and, and, and what kind of links to, for example, organizations, for example, in Europe with the United States or others to assist in the kinds of issues that you're talking about, whether it be education or entrepreneurship? Yeah, on, on, maybe let, let me start with the last in place. I mean, we, we are advancing direct democracy and I think there's a global move towards that because I think all of us look all over the world and think that democracy is under threat and we've got to find a way of fixing it. So I have a partnership with training institutions both in Singapore and the US through Chandler, through a few others. And, and that's become quite a key focus. On the education space, we're dealing with... Um, organizations like for example we've got an organization that's sponsoring for 20 us dollars english lessons for kids who are poor and i'm trying to make sure it's linked up to cell phone companies so that if any child buys an, a sim card for an additional 200 rands they can get oxford level english lessons all the way through we've got some global companies that have put curriculum that is online i'm working now at a program with google to try and say how do we make sure that we can avail, if you like, uh, cheaper, off-digital education curriculum in schools, all of that. So that's what we're working with and making sure that data connectivity is less in that regard. So that's that's one aspect of the program. And on the int entrepreneurship space, uh, with, like I'm busy at, the, at this point in time trying to build an equity fund that can help stimulate for micro enterprises because there are two problems. Your first is that someone who's looking for 80,000 is different to someone who's looking for 80 million, as an example. Now, the 80 million guy or the 100 million guy, we, there are institutions that we can try and help with that. But the 80,000 rand guy, here's the guy who can get direct cash transfers to make sure that they can do some stuff. So we're always raising capital through organizations to try and do that. And I know we're partnering with other organizations like Over the Rainbow to train them and there's all of this kind of work that we're trying to get right. So we're a new movement. I've, I feel personally that for an, an organization that's just over a year now, we've really built our infrastructure. We, we're growing well. And now we're going into the second year to try and ramp up the work that we've been doing. So, 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 so to me, it's all about activism and creating those partnerships, both locally and internationally. There's one question from Martin, who's, I think you might have answered in the last, in your last discussion uh, point. He said, what are Moosey's thoughts on how to utilize white capital for the benefit of the country and to ensure an inclusive future for the benefit of all? I think you might have touched on that, but if you want to just directly yeah. deal with that. Yeah, look, uh, firstly, I, I want to say this unequivocally. So I think white South Africans have a great role to play in this country. And capital isn't just a matter of money, it's skills, it's network, you know, one of the biggest, biggest assets that anyone, particularly Black South Africans, do not have is networks, right? If you get a business in IT who's trying to just get started, they don't have that social capital. So I think white South Africans and white, I mean, the definition of white capital is a term that I know has been ambiguous in certain spaces, but if you define it as uh, the advantaging that is accrued over a number of years, we can use that to full effect by saying, how do we help us contribute here? But I'm really playing on saying, how do we create this equity fund that is able to do two things, deal with jobs and deals with justice. And um, South Africans who are committed contribute to that with a partnership between that and the state. And we can be able to put financial capital and social capital to new startups so that we can broaden the pool of entrepreneurs that come through. And I think white South Africans can be able to do that and on a skills basis be able to assist. And if we truly, truly uh, participate together in the economy, it's not the legislation that's gonna make a difference because people will find a way to get out of legislation, but to open up the network. Uh, I think that for, I've seen it now in business as I've become more engaged in business, the guy who sometimes runs a restaurant 
also run the farm where the food is farmed and the transport company that delivers the, the, the food to the restaurant. So can you not open up and channel there and say, we're not going to run that business. Let's allow new enterprises to come in and do that. Because then when we do that, we really create an ecosystem of prosperity. Yeah. Um, th there's a question which, which I'm going to ask you, but I, I see we're running out of time. So I do want to ask you, which I'll come back to this question. Where do you see yourself, South Africa, your kids in 10, 20 years time? 30 years time. Firstly, I'm going to run for president in 2024. So that's for anyone who's thinking we're not going to do that. I'm just telling you up front. Hi, I'm Musi. I'll be, I'm running for president. There. Well, Musi, let me, let me respond by, unfortunately, <laughs> you're running against me. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I, I thought we could do a running mate kind of thing. Yeah, running mate. Yeah. Yeah, we could do a whole partnership. It would be great. <laughs> Uh, you can you can be the senior statesman or something, <laughs> but but uh, this you know history does repeat itself sometimes for bad reasons sometimes maybe it teaches us the conditions that are coming. What I think South Africa is going to experience is now we're going through that phase. You call it cath catharsis in the Zondo Commission, but I think it's the lowering of confidence, and the National Party had to go through exactly the same thing to come to a point where we said, we can't just carry on like this, right? Business confidence was low. Uh, economic outputs were low. There was a RAND crisis. There are a couple of issues that are occurring around about that time. And those are prevailing conditions for change. So if you say to me, what kind of script would I like to write for South Africa? Firstly, I think we need to, it's it's not about even the 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 replacement of, 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 of the NC, but I think I want my kids to grow up in a country where they can live in a post-liberation era politics. They must be able to know that they can express their choice of who to vote for, not on the back of liberation, but on the back of saying, I like this party, I don't like this party, this party governed in the last five years, they were great or not great, I like that one because these ones were better or not better, or whatever, but they must at least have choice. Because in the absence of choice, then really you don't have democracy. So let's build that. Secondly, yeah. the problems of South Africa are not too difficult to solve, actually. At the same time as all of the lamenting that goes on, frankly, I think South Africa, South Africa doesn't have a money problem. It's unlike many other African countries, we don't have actually have a money problem. We've got financial resources in this country. If you look at the reserves, if, even if you look at how the JSC is performing, Despite all of the difficulties, yes, many of our companies are reliant on, on foreign trade, like NASPERS, et cetera, but in truth, there's still cash reserves. So investment is about flicking a switch in some ways. And I think if we can give that confidence, we'll see investment flow in this country. We're not suffering from natural disasters. South Africa isn't dealing with hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, the stormers might lose a game or two, but heck, that's not a natural disaster. Frankly, we have an opportunity to to say, given, to fix ESCOM is about changing policy. It's not like trying to even build more power stations because I think people are available. To, to, to be able to stimulate entrepreneurs is about allowing that money flow and giving policy certainty. To fix education is about saying, hey, technology is able to be a disruptor in this sector. So the problems of South Africa are not insurmountable. They're quick. Given the right leadership, we can produce the change. So, so in the next 10 years, I think, we, we, we really are poised to be great as a country. And then the last thing is this continent of Africa. We often forget that we are the southern tip of the fastest growing continent in the world. 1.2 billion people are going to live here. So we've got to ask ourselves, what are we going to do with a population dividend? Are we going to let it override us or are we going to benefit from it? And majority of those people are going to be young people. Wouldn't it be great if South Africa would say, can we trade with the rest of Africa in order to be able to create entrepreneurs that are international in the sense that they are trading in Africa and we can derive more revenue. So I am personally going, it's gonna to be tough for the next five years. Let's not kid ourselves. COVID is gonna be with us for a while. But if we get our politics, we get our leadership, rebuild the center, heck, this country will be the best place to live in. I can promise you that for now. And I'm that confident about it. Okay, let me ask you the last question before I hand over to the old team. 
And that comes from Leslie, who puts in the chat, how do we instill an entrepreneur mindset into the youth when all they want is a job? They want a job. How do we make entrepreneurship sexy so we can create businesses that don't operate from a position of fear? And let me just lead up to your how you answer it. My ancestors came from Lithuania, as many Jewish South Africans did, with nothing, not a cent in their pockets. And they built up so that people like myself could obtain a decent education and have a, a, a affluent lifestyle, an advantaged lifestyle through entrepreneurship. They started off by what are called smosis, traveling through the countries, country rural districts, selling goods, wares. My mother sold shoes, which she bought a pair of, she would buy from the factory for 100 rand, she'd sell it for 105 rand. That five rand multiplied and eventually it became um, a profit which could be considered as um, useful for my education. How do we instill that sexiness into a youth whose first port of call is, I want a job? How do we change that mindset? Yeah, you, you know, you know and, and Leslie can call me at another point. I, and call me out, she can disagree with me all she likes. I don't actually think that that's what young people want. It looks like that because maybe there's an interaction that we've got. I've lived in the townships. The GDP of a township like Mamelodi is over 2 billion rand a year. When you look at um, the amount of money that leaves this country to informal traders, the so-called Somalians, Treasury is reporting between 4 to 5 billion rand a month. The truth of the matter is that entrepreneurs are there. You know, when I lived in the township, I never used to have to go anywhere to get my shoes fixed, to get my hair cut, to get my clothes made, to get the, the Soweto festival of entrepreneurs it was a celebration of diverse people. So entrepreneurs are there. The difficulty is this is that if you limit the opportunity for those entrepreneurs to take it to one step further, you end up in a space where you disincentivize the reward behind it with the greatest of respect to Jewish South Africans. The biggest gift that I think the struggle forged amongst Jewish South Africans is actually a value for education and the leveraging thereof. Jewish South Africans, I mean, it isn't a joke to hear of the Jewish mother says, well, who wants their child to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be whatever. We as South Africans, if you were to say to me, where's my investment? I would look at educating our society more broadly and asking better of ourselves because we've, we've removed that. The entrepreneurs are there if we're able to give them venture capital, give them the proper training, you'll see them. Because I frankly believe that take a drive with me Go to Vilagazi Street. There, there are restaurants that are booming in Vilagazi Street. The innovation that is there. Sometimes we don't celebrate them enough because we don't give them the appropriate opportunities or the capital or the social support or the access to broader markets and the celebration that comes with it. Because we need to be able to sometimes stop and say, hey kid, you've done an incredible job. Go to Umdanzan. You'll see these entrepreneurs, they are there. So all I'm asking is, Let's stop asking people to all sell oranges in the township, which is a survivalist economy. Let's ask them to do something better. Ask them to give better education so that they can derive new opportunities. And I really believe this country you'll see will thrive because I know the amount of money that circulates in townships. It is immense. We just don't talk about it because we live in this division between formal and informal. But come with me to that sector you'll see for yourself how powerful it is in that space. I must say, thank you, Musi. It was very enlightening for me to hear um, your insights and I wish you good luck with um, One South African Movement, as I'm sure Ort does, which aligns itself with the kinds of ideas that you articulated today. So let me hand over to Ort and Ort Jet to say thank you very much and uh, to wrap up. Thank you very much, Musi. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks, Anton. Well, Musi, I've been given the, um, the, the great honor to, to, to thank you. Um, and I just want to thank you for always showing up for our community. And I've known Musi for a number of years. And in fact, 
the very first time I met him was at the Absa Jewish Achievers Award many, many years ago. And he's always, every time I've put a hand up and say, Musi, please will you come and talk to us? Um, he's done so many radio interviews um, on Chai FM, um, SA Jewish Report, and I'm always asking you for these favors. And really, thank you for giving us your time. And I know how valuable um, your time is, particularly at the moment. And for those of you who don't know, Musi is in the trenches. He walks the talk. And, and one of the things that I admire about you, Musi, is that I remember um, two nights before a hard lockdown, I get a call. I was actually sitting on my balcony. It was about 10 o'clock at night. And Musi said, Dawn, I need your help. We have to get into the townships and distribute sanitizers and distribute water and distribute flyers. We have to educate people about this virus. And we spent uh, 24 hours um, really just, just enabling um, us to mobilize the education process. And the one thing that Muthi said to me after, you know, there we were handing out sanitizers, but actually people didn't have running water you know, to, to, to wash themselves, but they were cleaning their hands. So, Mursi, I've always um, admired you and I've admired your, your very deep um, understanding and your, your, your very deep commitment for entrepreneurship, for education and creating employment in our country. And I do believe that entrepreneurship is um, the engine um, that fuels innovation, it fuels education, it fuels employment, and at the end of the day, all of that e equals economic growth. Um, so uh, we're all with you. You know, let's work together as active citizens in creating um, an environment and a country that is conducive to growing more young entrepreneurs. We need more young entrepreneurs. So many of the thriving countries around the world have moved away from business, big businesses and, and really the focus is on, um, on, on small businesses. Um, and, you know, through Ort, we've opened up. I mean, Ort have many people on our program, um, many people of all races and religions and, and, and it really is exciting when you get everyone together and you talk about the challenges that, that we're facing, not only as, as, as a Jewish community, um, and I think my association with ALT has always been one of um, immense gratitude and appreciation for the things that you're doing for not only people in our community, but outside of our community. And I just want to say to you and Anton, um, I'm very sorry for both of you. 2024, this country needs a female leader. And I'm putting my hand up. Uh, great. <laughs> Anton it's and all. You know what? The, yeah, I'll be in the race with the two of you. But really, I can't thank you enough um, for leaving us with so much hope, with so much insight, takeaways. You're always inspiring. And thank you for sharing your vision um, with us. I wish we had more time. And really, I'm always humbled um, when I hear you and how you started off in life and where you are today. So really, thank you so much um, for giving us your time today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everybody, and thank you to Orton. Thanks for your kind words, Don. Thank you.